Today I want to go over some ideas from this book called Business Secrets of the Bible. I will tell you that I am a redneck, West Texan Christian. I'm not ashamed of any of that, but I'm not here to cram any religion down your throat. I just want to share with you some of the things that I learned from this book. Now, I have a very exact way of shopping for books. I go walking through the bookstore, and if I see something I think interests me, I buy it. So when I was looking at this book, it said business. I'm interested in business, secrets. I'm a magician, so I like secrets. And the Bible, I believe in the Bible, and I think it has a lot of wisdom. So I started reading this book. I've read it probably several times at this point. I'm going to share with you out of about eight different chapters of the 40, a few highlights. And hopefully this will help you in, in some way with your own business. Now we're going to talk a little bit about money and investing, how you might want to do that. So I just saw an investment yesterday on the internet. And it sold for 120 grand. You guys see this? Yeah. So, there we go. Does anybody want to invest $120,000 in that? I guess it's probably not, right? Anybody familiar with this? Yeah. Okay, let's start with business secrets of the Bible is chapter number one. It says, as long as we grow our own wheat, corn, make our own clothes, we don't need anybody else. And as I mentioned last, uh, last time we had a meeting together, if you try to do everything yourself, you can't know how to build a house, do IT, financial management, physical therapy, you can't know how to do all those. But I think you can specialize in a few things. So one of the things that it talks about in this book, which was written by a rabbi named Daniel Lappin, uh, is that God gives financial abundance by depending on others. Now I will tell you, when I first started reading this book, all I really thought about with business was balance sheets, P&Ls, how much a unit the price is, depreciation, working with the CPAs, whatever. So this book really opened my ideas to a concept I'm gonna share with you in a few minutes that making money is not just a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. And I'll explain that more in just a little bit. So he said in his book that we can make more with less efforts when we specialize in a trade this is called business. And if you specialize, you can have more disposable income and not spread ourselves too thin. So can you think of any services that you've had in the last week that you couldn't do yourself? Car fix, massage. Yes, I had that problem too. Haircut, she said. I probably could do that myself, but yeah. <laughs> right, how about if you needed an electrician? I don't know how to do that. A so. massage. A massage. Yeah. So, what is a business? And what he wrote in there is that a business is any person or group that has customers. So, if you're an employee of a bank and you don't own the bank, do you have customers? Absolutely, I think you do. He also went on to say if you care about your customers as people, if you like them and are willing to serve them, you will be rewarded. You'll be rewarded for serving other people. Here's something for you to think about. What would happen if all the people disappeared today? Except you. What would business be like? Slow. Slow. <laughs> Good answer. There's always a comedian. Yeah, it would be pretty slow. So does it make sense that in business, the more people you have to interact with, the more possibilities that you have? One of the things he talks about in his book is that Jewish people are disproportionately wealthy 
and heads of our CEOs of companies. And he, sp he spouted some statistics, some statistics, I don't remember exactly what they are, but he says that they have known through the Bible about specialization since day one, because my understanding is that Jewish people had something to do with the Bible years ago. He went on and he talked about in Genesis 49, 1 through 28, in Deuteronomy 33, 29, 1 through 29, he talks about a man in the Bible blessing his 12 different kids. And in there, it talks about some of the things that they're going to do. It says one is going to make wine, some are leaders, some are soldiers. It says something about a ship and ports. I don't know if that means business or shipping. And he says that the blessings that we have, or the blessings that he gave his children, were about unity as a group with diversity. You do a lot of different things. Randy back here knows how to build roads. This nice young lady right here knows how to sell real estate. We've got some electricians up here. So everybody has at least one, maybe more, specialization. Then each family in his group depended on their relatives to stay united, and each family could get efficient with their skills. So if you are a solitary survivalist, which means you don't need anybody, you may view people as a threat, but a business professional depends on serving others to make their life better. Any questions on that? Chapter seven is other people's needs. And he starts off this chapter, he says, does God want you to be rich? I don't know. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true, but he points out that God wants a man and a woman to live in marriage. And he also wants us to be obsessively preoccupied with others' needs and wants. So would it be a surprise that God would reward people in a marriage that served each other or businesses where you served other people? So there's some commonality there. The best way to make money is to provide a service that others want or need. So, if this is your service, right here, I think that's a pretty limited market for you. Earning a living requires you to make money and not take money. Uh, lately, I've been hearing a lot of things about socialism, which I don't really care for too much. And um, when you do that, you're just taking money from people. Making money is the process of doing something of value for somebody else. Does that make sense? Okay. Why do some companies offer money back guarantees? Because they already know that their service and their product is good. So when you see these money back guarantees, how many of them do you think uh, get shipped back? Probably not too many because they already, they already know that they're serving their company, their customers well. Willful transaction happens when customers want your service more than the money in their pocket. So anytime you're putting a product together, what you gotta think about, like a balance, is is that person willing to give up the money in their pocket for what you have to offer? Making money when done in an honest manner is an open, in an open and transparent marketplace is dignified and moral. So if you're selling illegal drugs, is that a moral occupation? I don't think so. If you're a pharmacist and you're providing medicine to help people, is that a moral occupation? I would think it would be. Money is a consequence of working and not the goal. Money is the consequence of working and not the goal. 
ask others, um, if you sit down next to somebody in, on an airplane, why don't you ask them, what do you do to serve your community? They'll probably go, I'm oh, great, I had to sit next to this guy. <laughs> what kind of answers do you think you'll get from that question? My guess is they're probably going to tell you about what volunteer work they do. Volunteer work. So, supplying others with goods and services for pay and profit is no less an act of serving humanity than volunteer work. Frequently you hear about different companies and they will say, well, we're giving back to their community. So here's a thing to think about. If you're a company and you never donate any money into the community, you are still providing a tremendous service by helping to churn the economy and provide jobs for people. Money is what comes to us when we focus on serving God's children. The money you make substantiates the values of your effort. Have you ever heard of anybody that will, has a, a great skill and they'll provide a service for somebody and then they're embarrassed to get paid for it? Yeah. To have repeat customers, you must earn the customer's favor and trust. And getting down on your knees to serve others is not demeaning, but a blessing. One of the examples he talks about in this book is that if you're an executive for Nordstrom's, one of the first things they do is have you work in the shoe department, and guess what you have to do? You have to get down on your hands and knees and serve people. Now, some people may think that that's demeaning. In my company, everybody that comes to work for us knows that they have to be willing to clean a toilet. If they're not willing to do that, they're out. So we've got to be able to do anything that comes our way. And we don't consider any kind of word demeaning. He had a story in there about how when he was a teenager, his, he bought up, saved up, bought a new car, and it broke down. And so he took it to a mechanic. The mechanic fixed the car. And when he went in to pay the bill at age 16, the guy who fixed it, the mechanic, who was a friend of of Rabbi Latin's dad, he said, there's no charge for that. <coughs> and he said, you don't understand, this is my car, it's not my dad's car, so I need to pay the bill. And what he told the kid was, um, when you get older and have children of your own, you will discover that the best thing somebody can do for you is to do something for their kids. Do something for their kids. Now, where is big money made, usually? In small towns or, city or big cities? Small towns. Well, I have here big cities are where the money can be made because you have a strong number of people that you can interact with. So if you think about it in uh, China over the last 15 years, what's happened to their rural population. So I'll move to the big city because that's where the action is. Now, I don't know how that ties into the use of the internet because I think the internet has taken the world and, and shrunk it a little bit as far as business. But most of the, you're gonna have more opportunities in a big city. Now, I've lived in big cities. I've lived in Dallas and Houston. I'll, I don't plan on ever going back. But the point is this. If we can all make the Alamo Grotto better, as far as our business community, all of us, the pie gets bigger for us. The other thing he talks about is that one of the reasons Israel has done so well economically, has anybody ever been to Israel recently? Only three or four years ago, it is stunning the amount of patents that they have, more proportionally, I think, than any other nation in the world. The economy that's going on over there, all the high tech, low tech, it's just stunning, but it's a small country. I think it's 100 miles by 30 miles or something like that. So there's a lot of interaction between their people in a small uh, space. The other thing you talked about is, have you ever noticed that wherever Home Depot 
opens up, blows his, is somewhere close by. <coughs> so he talks in his book about the concept of jewelry stores may open up very close to each other because that draws more people to that area that are looking for diamond rings than having them all spread out. So your density of customers is increased quite a bit. He also said that your income may be proportional to the number of people that you know. Why would that be? I think it's because you get more chance to have interaction with people. What else might be proportional to your income as, in addition to the number of people that you know? I'm thinking about your vocabulary. I've read studies that said the bigger your vocabulary, and the better you're able to express it will probably be proportional to your income, directly proportional. So I want to read to you a page out of this book. Could you hold this for me? Genesis 4 8, Cain said to his brother Abel, nothing. He didn't say anything to him. Cain says nothing to him. It's unclear in the scripture what he said. But, uh, we were just told that Cain spoke to Abel. But what they spoke about is not reported. Was it the weather? Not likely. Nothing in the scripture is irrelevant, though. Nothing in scripture is accidental. Nothing in scripture tells us anything that we could have known by ourselves. We know that Cain spoke to Abel and we did not see, we did not know what he said. Why? Now you're looking at me like, what the heck is he talking about? I don't want <laughs> the Bible doesn't have to tell us what he said because ancient Jewish wisdom fills the rest of the story in for us. If we're willing to read between the lines, we can figure out the mystery. We know that Adam and Eve are getting old and are gonna die. And Cain gets hold of Abel and says, here's what's going on. Dad's going to be dead soon. Mother's going on her way. That means that we will inherit the earth. And I just want to establish with you that since I'm the oldest son, I will be getting everything, and you may live wherever you want, but you'll have to pay me rent. I wonder how that story turned out. <laughs> Abel said back in return, Cain, no, I don't think you understand it's not going to be like that. As a matter of fact, we're going to be splitting it in two. And he said, no, nope, I don't like your division. So how does Cain, whose name literally means acquisition in Hebrew, and whose only purpose in life is taking from others, react to this refusal? Kill his brother. This is a natural choice because other people are the obstacle to his wealth, right? Or other people your obstacle to wealth? I don't think so. He thinks that if he can get rid of everybody else, then he will have everything to himself. Abel wants half of what this is. And Cain's response was, Abel has to go. So God then punished Cain in a way that made him appreciate and understand the error of his ways. He finally understood, rich people do not detract from your life, they enrich it. <coughs> By the way, this is something I've noticed, poor people don't create jobs. You ever notice that? I don't know what you just have. So the more people you have around you in a community that are doing well, the better off things will be for you. It goes on to talk about how Cain then formed a city and uh, he learned his lesson about business and about dealing with other people. Can you hold this for me, Debbie? Thank you. Can you hold the book. So in the Jewish community, have you ever heard names like Wasserman, Silverman, or Goldberg? <laughs> you ever wonder where they got those names? That's because what their family does. That's what they specialize in. So if you're named Goldberg, maybe at some point in your family, all they did was work with gold. Don't ask how to make money. 
Ask how you can better serve others and how you can improve their lives. Then you have to notify the people of what you can do for them. So what do you call that? Marketing or advertising. Yeah. And after that, the money will follow. Let's go on to chapter 18. I love this one. It says you have to learn to follow before you can lead. Now, what does that mean? So he said when we're young, we enter the workforce and have to learn to take orders in respect of authority. <laughs> to move up, you've got to be able to do that. Now, do we have a problem in our labor force these days yep. with people that don't have those kinds of characteristics. He goes on to say that the public schools do not prepare kids to be employed. And that adds to poverty. Does that make sense? We do not promote a will-do spirit in kids. You know what they call people that have a will-do spirit? The boss. That's what I've noticed. Employers want perseverance and commitment attitudes. And if you can hold down a job in high school or college, that shows that you've learned to take orders and accept responsibility. Your employees, or it could be co-workers if you're not the owner, need to see you in action being subservient and serving your customers. That's why in my clinic, I can't say I do it every day, but frequently each time during the week, I'll be picking up some trash, cleaning the toilet, whatever needs to be done. And I don't feel, about, feel badly about that. So this model of knowing that serving others is a blessing starts early in the customs for Jewish kids and the Jewish culture of service to a higher authority, that is taught to them early on. Your kids will be looking to see how you treat your parents as a model for their behavior towards you down the road. So think about that. What kind of message are you sending your kids with the way you treat your parents? And the last thing in this chapter was successful adults seek and have mentors. So how many in here are under the age of 45? Raise your hand. A lot of them. So here's my recommendation specifically to you, but this could be to anybody. Make a list of 15 people in Alamogordo that you think are a success. Doesn't mean they have to have money. 15 people that you consider a success. Call them up and ask them to go to lunch. You buy. And you sit there and ask them questions about their life and what's made them successful. And while they're telling you, you saturate your mouth with shut up <laughs> and listen to what they have to say. Of that 15, you pick three or four that you think you really connect with and you call them up and you ask them if they would formally be a mentor for you. If they would formally be a mentor. Now I'm gonna tell you a secret. People that are, let's say, over 50 or 55 love to share with younger people what they've learned because they've had to pay the price. Or maybe you should say enjoy the price for what they've learned. If you take 15 successful people to lunch and ask them some questions about their lives, you're going to be a whole lot smarter at the end of that time. And you're going to start to see a pattern of things that these people will tell you. All right. Let's go on to chapter 20. Leadership in your mouth. Some doctors, he says in his book, make a great living and some don't. Why the difference? Do you, do you ever, when you go to the doctor, do you ever look up on the wall to make sure that they graduated from medical school? Or do you ever check their credentials? I don't. How do you usually know which doctor to go see? That's right. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. How about that? So 
Most people pick their doctor by word of mouth or when someone speaks highly of you. So the ability to earn a lot of money versus a little may be the way you communicate. Have you ever known a doctor that might know what they're doing, but their bedside manner isn't very good? Does that make you want to have them work with you in the future if you have a problem? <laughs> How about if your doctor is a good communicator and actually talks to you like a person and treats you that way? Is that more appealing to most people? So if you think about doctors or anybody else that are successful, that are well-respected, probably one of the common denominators is going to be the way they communicate. If you want to improve your speaking three times a week for 30 minutes, read out loud. Because your soul and your body hears what you're saying. And it will help you enunciate better. So I'm going to tell you that there's probably at least one person in this room that would not want to be up here doing what I'm doing right now speak in front of a group. Is there anybody that's afraid of that? There's a couple. So a couple in the back. So being able to get up and talk in front of a small group and do that well is a tremendous confidence builder. I was very lucky that when I was about 12, I got interested in being a magician. And I've been up in front of more people than I can count speaking. I'm not saying I'm the best in the world, but it doesn't freak me out to get up here to talk to you guys. And I feel as comfortable talking to this group right here as if you and I were talking together over lunch. Anybody ever heard of Toastmasters? This is separate from the book. There's a group called Toastmasters which can help you become a better speaker. They have a chapter here in Alamogordo. I don't know where they're meeting now. They met at my clinic for about 10 years. You mean at the chamber? So the meeting at the chamber. There you go. <laughs> I would highly recommend you go to Toastmasters if you want to be a better speaker. You will give some speeches, you will hear some speeches and analyze those and in a friendly, positive way, they will help you get better. So if you want to raise your income, become a better communicator, Toastmasters is a great way to do that. How are we doing on time? Halfway, all right. This one, chapter 29, was about feeling right about making money. So we just talked a minute ago about how some people are embarrassed about collecting money for their service. What is one thing that might separate people that make a little bit of money from a lot of money? One of the answers I think is some of the people that make a lot of money aren't ashamed to be rewarded for their expertise and their services. Very important concept. He talks in his book about if you buy a book on self-defense and you read it, and you go to a big city like New York City and somebody tries to mug you, you're not gonna have time to think, okay, on page 39 they talked about <laughs> knife attacks. So here's what I need to do. Sometimes you just have to go with your gut and how you feel about things. A business professional must feel right about making money and not just think about it. If you do a great job of something, don't feel bad about taking money for your service. Learn and practice the principles of business until you are comfortable with them. Accepting money for providing a good service is nothing to be ashamed about. But I see this all the time. You can get an MBA, a fancy internship at a Fortune 500 company, but working on the, your spirit of serving others will probably make things happen more. Money is like blood. It needs to flow. Would you open that book to 213? Thank you. Now we're going to talk about... Thank you. He said, you need to internalize the lesson that money is good. Do not be ashamed of owing. Do not be ashamed of owning or earning money. 
When you take money from a customer, you do so in exchange for serving them. You are doing them a favor for which you are being rewarded. There is nothing shameful or immoral about this, or on the contrary, it is the most basic way in which you can and must serve your fellow man. Someone who has acquired much wealth is someone who has done much good in the world. Once you internalize this lesson, once you really feel it, your whole relationship with the world, customers, and other business professionals will change for the better. All right, chapter 31, count your money. He says, losing weight without a scale is difficult. Does that make sense? Because you don't know if you've lost or gained. So how do you keep track of that? And knowing where... Uh, uh, knowing where you are can really give you some encouragement. Wealth is built by putting away a little more each day, and the only way to appreciate this is to keep records. Buying a $200 pair of shoes is instant positive feedback, like QVC or Amazon.com. You get anything you want sent to your house the next day, and that gives you immediate fulfillment. Saving does not give a person the same effect. It's just, that, just not as exciting. But tracking your progress with math gives you encouragement. It gives you continued feedback. I know a lot of people that don't treat their home budget like a business. And they don't know really how much money they have or how much they've spent. Or sometimes I've seen husband and wife where they don't communicate about the money or they don't agree how money's going to be spent. So if you can ever get on the same page with that, you'll be a lot more effective. It also says in his book that there are five words in Hebrew that mean counting. Mm -hmm. And they all have different nuances, but uh, it must be pretty important if they have five different words for it. And the last thing he says in this chapter is work on becoming financially literate. How many of you can look at a balance sheet and really tell what's going on? There's a few of you in here. A couple of you in here. So it's amazing to me that in the land of capitalism, we have so many people that are ignorant with financial literacy. How does that, how's that happen? If we were in a communist country or a socialist country, that might make more sense. So if you want to raise your income or improve your business, improve your financial literacy. If you have kids, help them at a young age. Start to understand basic things like it's better to have more money come in than go out each month. <coughs> Okay, the last one I have is, would you open the deck, page 224. By the way, um, since we're talking about counting your money, any of you use QuickBooks? Know about QuickBooks? Have you ever used QuickBooks 88? <laughs> You use QuickBooks 88? <laughs> well, here it is from 1988. Oh, yeah. I was like, I've never even heard of that. This is my wife and I's budget book. Oh, wow. <laughs> which we were having a good time with, looking at last night. <clears throat> so you'll be glad to know that on October of 1988, on the 2nd, we spent $22.96 at the grocery store. <laughs> Now, for those of you that can't really comprehend this, <coughs> what is that in today's dollars? <laughs> Move the decimal. I don't know, but here's what you would do today. You would plug it in. <laughs> and that's how you would do your accounting. So this is QuickBooks 1988 right here. And I'm, I'm really glad we, we held on to that. <laughs> E3, uh, E3, yeah. All right, let's see here. Um, 20. 20 bucks at the grocery store. 
Mm -hmm. Believing that money is physical is a terrible, fatal handicap to any decent person or society. Such belief robs you of the ability to participate in business ethically. Thankfully, you do not need to believe this. Money is not finite. You ever thought about that? If money was finite, you'd only have so much. But what happens to the size of the pie the more the trains go on? What does the pie do? It grows. Money is not interchange interchangeable with products and services. They can be exchanged, but they're not interchangeable. This is because cost and value are not the same thing. Let me give you an example. Suppose I buy a pair of shoes at a local shop for $25. I had been looking for those shoes for weeks, and I finally had them. A friend compliments me on them and wants to know how much they cost. I tell him, and he offers to buy them for me for $25. I say, no, I want to keep them. That's why I bought them. But is this logical? Aren't they worth $25? No, they cost me $25. But they are worth more than that to me. He then offers me $30, but I say no, because I don't want to have to go to the trouble of tracking down another pair. Now, suppose my friend offers me 50 bucks for the shoes. Now I was, now I was better off than I was before I bought the shoes. And I could still go buy now some fancier shoes. If you were drafting a balance sheet, it would post a $25 profit. And how about my friend? He paid $50, so clearly the shoes were worth more to him than to me, and he's happy. Is there anything wrong with that? So in this instance, the fellow liked the shoes more than the money in his pocket. Everyone wins. This economic pie is now larger, and we're all better off for the transactions. This may seem mundane because we never stop to think about the miracle of such transactions, because such a win-win economic transac transaction is miraculous. You can literally create wealth from mid -air. Does that ever go on around here? Could you turn that page 227, please? Just another page. Thank you. So 227. This is really interesting to me. One Hebrew word for money is spelled K-E-S-E-F. The structure of the word is ancient Hebrew and is always based upon the meaning of the letters. <laughs> The spiritual meaning of a word can be understood by analyzing the meaning and order of the letters. The first and last letters of the word when combined spell kuf, K-U-F-F, -F, which is the Hebrew word for both the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot. What does that tell us? Well, back in, the back of the hand is primarily used for punching and hitting or for defense, but the palms of the hand are different. The fingers curve and bend towards the palms so that we may use them to do work and create things. Palms are therefore related to creation. The sole of the foot is used for movement and for transporting things. When we use our palms to create something, our souls carry them, the creation off the market, we are able to create value. A bucket of sand is not worth much, but if you wash your hand, if you use your hands and turn that sand into glass or silicone silicone chips and our feet carry it to the market, then we have created value and money. One of the things that I've learned from reading this book Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the things I learned from this book and from studying this guy, by the way, Daniel Lappin has a website. He's got all kinds of tapes and things that you can purchase to listen to. But he says that you can't really understand the Bible fully unless you understand the Hebrew language. And the thing that I just read you is a good example of that. To quote, I love this, to quote the British man of letter Samuel Johnson, seldom is any man more innocently engaged than when he's trying to increase his own income. Somebody who's trying to increase his own income is not hurting anybody. If he did, 
there would be no customers. Such a person is going to be racking his brains trying to figure out a way to make his life better so he can get paid for what he's doing. This is why I don't get worried when people tell me their goal in life is to make money. So if they're making money, what does that mean they're doing? Serving other people. On the other hand, I get very nervous when somebody tells me they want to go into public service. <laughs> I love that. That concerns me because I know that that means another pair of hands is reaching for my wallet. But when somebody just wants to make money, I can rest assured they will be doing something to help other people. Otherwise, they aren't going to get very far without making money. Helping and earning necessarily goes hand in hand, as we have discussed. The fact is, at the end of the day, the source of money is of money spiritual nature. That is the source of money spiritual nature, and what a wonderful thing it, that is that makes the world go round. So I've thrown a lot at you here. Anybody have any questions? I'm glad you guys understand it because I had to read this several times. <laughs> How much time do we have left? 15. 15, perfect. So I promised you three pretty good negotiating tips. These are on the back of your flyer. So if you want to have some fun, use this first one anytime somebody tells you no. There's something. Man, I wish I'd known about this when I was a kid. If you've been traveling all day and you go into a hotel and it's after midnight and you get up to the desk and the receptionist says, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have a room for you because we gave it away. What do you say? Without cursing. <laughs> you had a reservation. Here's my confirmation number. Here's my confirmation number. Or here's what I'll say, and this is a sentence that I couldn't even tell you how many times I've used this, and if you really want to have some fun, go home and use this on your spouse. <laughs> and watch the look on their face when you say this. So I want you to say to me, I'm sorry we canceled your room for tonight. I'm sorry we canceled your room for tonight. I'm sorry, but you'll have to do better than that. <laughs> when you say that, the look on their face is hysterical. But I don't use that every day, but anytime somebody tells me no, that's the first thing that pops into my mind. It's like a <laughs> reflex, because I'm bound to determine I'm gonna get what I want. So I'm sorry, but you'll have to do better than that. Now, these negotiating tips came from a cassette tape class that Belen and I got in 1989 by a guy named Roger Dawson. He's a real estate expert. He's got all kinds of books and tapes about negotiating. I would highly, highly recommend them. I can't tell you how much his information has helped me over the years. Not just maybe making an offensive move in negotiations, but knowing when people are doing the same thing to me. So, Let's reverse the scenario. I come in with this gentleman right here, and you're going to say to me again, I'm sorry, but we don't have a room for you tonight. And he said, he just said, I'm sorry, but we don't have a room for you tonight. And I will say to him, I'm sorry, but you'll have to do better than that. Now, there's a counter for that. He will now say, how much better? <laughs> so in this negotiating class, they teach you what to say, and they teach you to come back. Also, so if somebody does that to you, so check it out. The next one is called Refer to Higher Authority. Refer to Higher Authority. So if I'm negotiating with this gentleman right here, and he says, well, $50 a unit is our final offer. Now, what options do I have? I could accept it, or I could say, well, first of all, uh, I understand what you're offering, but I'm going to have to clear this with my board. So you're referring to a higher authority above yourself. 
and that lets you separate from him and now he's going to be thinking well who's on the board and what kind of people are they and what are they going to say now i have a friend who uses this technique all the time he's a uh, has a lot of real estate in southern california and he'll tell you he uses this technique a lot but his board meeting is in the shower <laughs> when he gets up in the morning, it's just him. So you can be your own board and you can refer to him. So if you're negotiating with somebody and they say, I'm sorry, I'll have to uh, talk to my board, you know that they might be playing you. So you have to figure out how you're going to deal with that. The last one is, uh, would you help me again? If you say, uh, we can only do $50 a unit. We can only do $50 a unit. Okay, I can do $50 a unit for you. What are you willing to do for me? And then you saturate your mouth with shut up. <laughs> and see what they say, that's called nibbling. Because if you know that you can do the $50, you might get a little extra with it. And I'll tell you, this is a nasty technique he talks about in this course. You go into a high dollar men's store and you buy, you got two or three thousand dollars worth of shirts, ties, suits, all this kind of stuff. And you know that this person, the salesman, is on commission. So right as he's ringing it up, you say, This does come with two free ties, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So now in their mind, they're going to be thinking, If I don't give it to him, he might not buy the suits. And the ties together are 100 bucks, my commission is 300, I'm still gonna pocket 200. Maybe that's worth it to him, maybe it's not. But if you've ever had that pulled on you, it's not much fun. So, that's my presentation for right now. Do we have any questions or comments? Yes, sir? You kind of touched on the workforce and kids today, or the younger generation today, not having the can do attitude. How do you address that? Well, I think we're slow to hire and quick to fire. Is that a problem? Yeah, it's a, it's a problem. I've had uh, most of the time we've screened people to come work for us for their technical abilities, that they can do the job, but they can't show up for work on time or they don't they don't even call in when they're late or i mean it's just um, they're not they're, i had a guy one time in a business i had up near albuquerque and we were having a rough time with it and we had to come back on some expenses so we got rid of the cleaning crew and i said um, so we're getting rid of those guys and he said well who's going to clean the bathroom i said you are and he said, quote, you'll have to stick an effing gun in my mouth before I'll go clean that bathroom. Now with me, that was a, what they call a career limiting gesture. <laughs> so the people that can show up for work on time, not let their personal lives overcome everything that, uh, that affects them doing their job, uh, they're out there, you just have to find them. You have to keep looking. Did that answer your question? Kind of. What did I not answer? How, how do you find them? How do you personally address the workforce issue? You mean when they're not performing? Mm -hmm. I just sit down and tell them. So I'll give you another example. I had a guy who couldn't show up to work on time. So I wrote him up three times and I said, here's the deal. If you're ever one second late again, it's your last day. So then you get to decide if you want to work here anymore. Took about a week before he showed up 45 minutes ago. So that's how we do, we do it. We don't usually fire people, they fire themselves in our business. So you gotta set, set what the parameters are. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. It's more of like an ethical question, but I say you have someone that, or that's stealing to pay for cancer, or there's like an extenuating circumstance that's causing them to be, I guess, unethical, but it's because of like the pressure of whatever's going on. Is there a way to approach that? 
Yes. Yeah, I call them the bullies. <laughs> so let me tell you about that. He addresses this in this book. Now, this is the concept that I'm still kind of struggling with. If somebody steals money from me, I can go make that back at some point, but I can't make the time back that it took me to make the money that they stole. So after reading this book, I now have the opinion that if somebody steals from me, they're not stealing my money, they're stealing my time. And I don't know about you, but I think everybody has a finite number of heartbeats that they get. And if somebody steals your time, that's not good. So now, would I then still maybe help that person? Probably. But I just don't think there's any excuse for that because they're stealing my time. So do you know something I don't know? Okay. All right. Who else? Those cassette tapes, um, who would you say um, did those? Dawson, I missed the first one. Roger Dawson. Thank you. Roger Dawson. He's from England, I think. What's a cassette tape? <laughs> What's a cassette tape? Very funny. Well, you can probably get an automatic download. <laughs> also. Do we have any time left? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. A question about the banana. Yeah, the banana. <laughs> I was just showing that people will invest their money in anything. Now, I understand that whoever bought this and ate the banana, Sorry, about that. That. and now they're not just an artist, they're a performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you like to see, what time is it right now? 55. Right. Till. Six till. Okay, six still. Would you like to see an example of money changing hands? <laughs> I don't know. Come on, I'll put the orange to the board with super glue. When you buy it. <laughs> are you busy right now? I know you're busy talking, but are you busy right now? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Can you come up here and give me a hand? <laughs> What's your name? Tiffany. Tiffany, I'm Bob. Everybody say, hey, Tiffany. Hey, hi, Tiffany. I need somebody over here. How about this nice lady in the red shirt back here? What is your name? Erica. Erica, come on up. Everybody say, hey, Erica. Hey, Erica. <laughs> Anybody know about the history of a dollar bill? You know it's made of linen, mm -hmm. not cotton. Could you hold that for me, please? Did you know there's a serial number on either side of the bill and they match each other and they're just like your fingerprints? There's only one bill that has this serial number. On the back they have the, uh, the eagle on there. Do you know how many arrows are in the talons of the eagle? How many? 13. 13. One for each of the original colonies is what I've heard. Anyway, just a little trivia about the dollar building. Let's see, would you hand that over here? No. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, we'll have you do it. We'll have you sign your bill first. All right. On your bill right here, write your name in big letters. Oh boy. Okay, fair enough. All right, so is that your name on your bill? Yes. All right. Hold that quietly in your hand. <laughs> now it's your turn. Hold it out there where everybody can see it. This one will be your bill. Would you write your name right across there? Thank you. So we have... Erica's bill. I'll take that. What I'm going to do is tear off a little piece, kind of like a receipt. <laughs> and got, would you tear the rest of that off? Uh, I don't want to be the felon. <laughs> so thank you for finishing that. So, is that your name on the bill? All right. Um, put this in your hand like that. Close it tight. Pull it right there. So let's suppose that Tiffany 
owns a McDonald's. And Erica wants a McDonald's fried pie. And she wants that fried pie more than she wants the money that's in her pocket. So I want you to give her a pie. Go ahead, pretend. No, 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 no. Just pretend. Throw her a pie. All right. Now here comes a little piece of Erica's money between your thumb and finger. Just hold on to that. Now what's just happened here? I have no idea. Money just changed hands. A piece of money. And she committed a felony. When they wrote on it, they did. So, and they wrote on it. They defaced it, too. So there's two felonies. So here's the moral of the story. There's always money out there changing the hands. You just don't see it. Now here you saw the money changing hands. But unless it's your bank account or something that you're interacting with one other person, I have no idea where Justin has spent his money today, or Baxter back here. We don't know that, but sometimes we can see it. So now, she has part of your money, but really things are now reset because you unloaded the pie you needed to sell. You got something to eat, right? So now we're right back where we were. So would you open your bill and unfold it And you're right back where you started. Is that your name on the bill? It is. Really? How weird is that? <laughs> Would you open your bill? Is that your name on it? Hey, yes. <laughs> Would you look and tell me if those two zero numbers match? Yes. They're the same? <laughs> I don't know about you, but that creeps me out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So next time you start thinking about money changing hands, that will give you something to put in your mind. So thank you all very much for your time. I hope this was helpful. I would sure recommend the Business Secrets of the Bible book. Read that a few times. It will give you a different perspective on business and, and making money. Thank you. Thank you.